Okay. And we will get started. Now, um, the way we operate this is that um, I've got a series of questions that I'm going to ask you, but there's no wrong or right answers. They're just answers. And <clears throat> I will be using bits and pieces of this interview in various videotapes I'm making that are appropriate. The, where to emphasize a point in the video I'm making. Right. The other thing is when I get done with this, um, I'm going to send you a copy of the tape. I'm going to send it to you via an email link with a Dropbox. So you can go into the Dropbox, download it, look at it. And if there's anything in there you don't want to have in there, you tell me the, the topic that we're talking about and you'll see time uh, indicated on it, uh, the time, the, the minute seconds, and where you want me to start and where you want me to stop, and I'll delete that section. So awesome. you're in total control. Okay. Okay? Awesome. Right. Before we get started, I just want to say, uh, I just have to get this off my heart. Uh, when you message me, Bill, like I, I'm just so honored to even be on here with you. And I just had to say that before we even get started, I deeply respect you and admire you and your book is amazing. And I'm just, I'm really excited to be here. So thank you for even asking me to be a part of this and for this opportunity. I'm deeply grateful and honored. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and it's reciprocal. I feel the same way about you. Uh, ever since I met you in France, picked you up at the airport I've been, impressed with, I've been impressed with you so um thank you and your story your story is amazing so thank you that's it's a it's a love fest that's good <laughs> yeah <laughs> I know I was telling my mom about that in France when you were the first person that I saw and I was like so happy to see you and then at that dinner that night you sat next to me I don't know if you remember that but I was so nervous being there in France, like never even been there, but you just made me feel so comfortable. And so I was like, I know this interview is going to be fine because Bill is just a very easy person to talk to. So well, I already feel better. That's, that's a real compliment. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm going to start this differently than I've started every one of the interviews because you made such a powerful statement that I want to read it and I want your reaction. Okay. So you wrote, I view my journey as a beautiful success story full of struggle, pain, and perseverance. I feel very accomplished and proud of rising up through my struggles. Everything I've been through has molded and shaped the person I am today in a powerful way, living in full gratitude and deeply passionate to live life to my fullest potential. Now that is one heck of a powerful statement. Yeah. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So even when he just read it, like I just, I feel the emotions from my own life. Like anytime I'm ever sharing my story, I'll just like get little tidbits of memories of, you know, like when you just read it, I just got memories of just the fight, the climb. And I say a beautiful success story and that's full of pain because that's exactly what it was for me. And there was a long time in my life that I viewed it. And I resented my past. I resented the things that I went through being an alcoholic and hurting people. I resented those things about myself because obviously you're not proud of when you do things that you would have never want to do. But I know now today that every little thing in my life, every little step of the way, good and bad, has made me to this person sitting in this chair talking to Bill Blocker right now. And I couldn't be any more. When I say that I live in gratitude because the things that I've gone through and the pain, the pain that I walked around with every single day, I now get to be on the opposite end of that. And it makes me just deeply appreciate life in way more of a powerful way than I could have ever. I don't know if I would have gone through those things if I just had an, an easy life, I guess you could say if I would appreciate life as much as I do now and have the passion that I do to go out there and help other people. Like just, just an example today, I woke up and I was reading my book. I looked outside and it's just a beautiful, a beautiful blue sky. And I remember there was a time, um, sorry, I get emotional about my story because 
Good. I can't help good, it. good. That's fine. But, you know, I'm looking outside and it's a beautiful blue sky and I can see that color today and I can appreciate that color. It's a beautiful day. I'm clear. I'm focused. I feel good, healthy, and energized. To feel that and to be in a, in a room, because I used to isolate myself in my room and I would wake up from a blackout and I would just stare outside and it would be a sunny day with a blue sky and I would be so depressed and I could never appreciate though that blue sky, the, the sun shining down because I was in so much pain and I didn't want to live. So to be able to look outside and just see a blue sky, to me, it's not just a blue sky. It has meaning, it has purpose. And it's taken me a freaking climb to look at that blue sky and to just appreciate it and to just be grateful to be alive. That's the best way I can describe that. That, that is wonderful. That's, I mean, you just feel all kinds of things when you say what you just said. Now, there was a period of time where you were just caught up in all this garbage. But then you became aware that things had to change. There was this, this aha moment, this self-awareness that you're going to wake up dead someday if you didn't make changes. From yeah. that point to when you feel you had control and your life had, was turned around, how long was that? Five months? 20 months? Four years? How long? Gosh, I really can't give uh, an exact day when I woke up and I was like, I didn't think about having to take a drink today or... You know, I feel like I've, I've got control because to be honest, on a growth journey, I don't ever want to get to a place where I feel like I've got this because I don't got this. I have to do things in order to maintain where I'm at. So I can't really say that it was five months or a year, but I could say that the very first year of my sobriety was absolute. It, I, I want to use the word hell kind of because, I mean, even though it was such a, a beautiful year because so much happened in that year. I, I mean, I give anybody who gets 24 hours or 30 days or 60 days of sobriety, like the biggest respect, because when you're in addiction, for me, I remember when I got sober and I would look at people that had six months of sobriety. I was like, Oh my God, like how, how did you get six months, man? Because when you, when you wake up every day and your first thought is to drink and that's your mission and you drink until you pass out and you wake up every single day, and you do that day in and day out to even get 24 days or 24 hours of sobriety is a is a huge accomplishment. And for me, when things really got bad, I could always get two weeks. Two weeks was like my the longest I could go. And that was when things were really bad. And I was like, I'm never going to drink again. And that two week mark would hit and I would just I would drink again. And every time I drank, things got worse. They never got better. They always got worse. And for me, being the competitor that I am, it was always like a game to me. Like, how, how, how far can I take this, you know? Or I, in the beginning, somewhere along in my drinking career, I remember just believing that I will overcome this drinking and I'll be able to drink normal. So I chased that forever. Um, and then I would just fall and fall and fall, ultimately leading, you know, practically to my death. But like I knew that I was going to die soon. And the moment that I decided... The moment that I decided that I, that I asked for help, I'll never forget it. It's as clear as a bell. I was sitting in the hospital bed with my mom. My mom had completely cut me off at this point in my life, um, but I was stranded at a hotel and I was in a blackout. I don't remember texting her and asking her for help, um, but I did. And she came to that hotel. She had to knock on the door to wake me up and she saved my life. My mom is the one that saved my life. And I went to the emergency room and that was a normal routine for me. I went to every emergency room, Silverdale, Gate Harbor, Tacoma, like all of them. They all like knew me there. That's how often it was a, a it was a reoccurring thing. And I went there that time and they're not going to take me seriously, you know, that I'm asking for help. But I just remember in that moment, that night, as I'm coming to and I'm starting to like wake up a little bit, I knew that. If I didn't get help that day, 
that I was going to die. I was going to die. I really believe to the fullest, if my mom did not come help me and her and I both know now that God intervened because she came and got me and she had cut me off that day. Um, but I know that if she did not come and get me that day, that I would have died in that room. And I was sitting in that hospital bed. I was looking at my mom and the look that my mom had on her face is a look that I will never get out of my head and I don't ever want to forget it. I want that image to be there to remind me of the pain that I caused my mom. And the look on her face was like, I don't know if she's going to make it. Like she was preparing for me to die. She has even said that she was waiting for the day that she was going to get a call that I, that I was dead because of drinking. And I just remember looking at her face, um, just hoping and wanting me to get better, but not thinking that it was possible because I was so far gone that it was not even like, I don't even think there's hope for Savannah, right? And I just remember looking at her and then I said a prayer to God and I just asked for help. I had asked for help many times when I was in trouble and never meant it. But in that bed that night, I meant it. And I didn't know if I was going to get sober. I didn't know if I was going to stay sober. You know, you just don't know. But you have just tiny little speck of hope that maybe I don't have to live like this. Maybe I, maybe I can get sober and live a beautiful life. And I remember going to treatment. And again, being in detox for three days, not knowing if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to make it. They didn't even have a bed available. That, this is a whole other story. They didn't even have a bed available. And I'm begging them. I need to be here. But I remind you that I've been at this detox multiple times. So they don't believe me when I say they probably just think I want a place to stay because that's where really what it was. Anytime I went there, three days stay and then you're gone. Well, that was a bed for three nights recover, move on and drink some more. Right. But this time I wanted help. And I remember the lady there said, the only way that you're going to get a bed Savannah is if somebody doesn't show up to their bed date or if somebody leaves treatment. And I just remember looking outside the window there at detox. And it was just a gloomy, gloomy day here in Washington. You know how the days can look so dark. And I just remember praying like I, if I walk out those doors, if I don't get a bed date, I'm dead. I'm going to die. And on the third day of my detox, she walked in and she said, Savannah, you got a bed. And I just remember just crying in that moment because I was like, man, I have a chance. I have a chance. God gave me a freaking chance. And I've been sober ever since. So that's where my journey started right there. And I lived at that treatment center for three months. Um, it's only a 30 day treatment, but I was homeless. And I needed to be there. And again, another just God shot moment at the end of my 30 days, they have what's called the guest program. And it's a place where if you don't have a place to go when you complete treatment, you can apply and stay there. And again, there was only two beds and they were taken. I have a week left to complete. My mom's not gonna let me come back home. I'm like, if I go out this early, this early in my sobriety, I'm gonna go back and drink. And again, one of the girls left and relapse. Not that I wish that upon anybody, uh, but I was able to get a bed there. So I spent my first three months living in a treatment facility. From there, I went to a sober woman's living house. And I mean, my journey has just been a journey to get here. So. Wow. You, you just, you've accomplished some amazing things and gone through so much. Just amazing. All right, you had to fight not only your addiction to alcohol, but you had to fight the emotions. You were experiencing all kinds of negative emotions, all kinds of negative focus, all kinds of negative thinking, but you turned that around because we know if you focus on the negative, nothing positive happens. So how did you turn around that emotion commotion and get control of it and, and begin to focus more on the positive than all the negative crap that you were experiencing? Well, the best way, the, the best answer for me is I didn't do it by myself. I didn't do it alone. And I, I was guided. I was guided. So I started going to AA meetings and I sat in those rooms for 10 months, listening to people, how they got sober, that they worked the steps, they got a service position, they helped others go through the steps and none of that I wanted to do. I didn't want, and I, I didn't want anything to do with that. 
So I'm 10 months sober, I'm sitting in that chair and I'm still miserable, I'm still unhappy, I'm still in pain, and I'm still listening to how these other people took action and did those very things and their life got better. I'm sober, but I'm not happy. I wanna be happy, I wanna feel good. And in order for me to get that, I had to become willing to do the things that they were doing. So I raised my hand, I got a sponsor, or I mean, yeah, I raised my hand and I asked this woman to be my sponsor and she was my guide. My guide meaning she took me through the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's step by step. The book of Alcoholics Anonymous is clear cut directions. If you want sobriety and if you want to have a happy, fulfilling life, you got to do this. You got to do this, this and this. And she took me through the steps and by taking me through those steps, that's when everything started to just change, become lighter and become brighter. And I started to really experience sobriety. So for me, that, that was being guided, how I started changing those, the emotion commotion that your book talks about, how I started getting those negative things into positive and transforming my mind, because that's what it's about. I don't have a drinking problem. I have a thinking problem. A lot of people think that they have a drinking problem, but it's a thinking problem. And once I started to change this up here, that's when everything started to change. And I believe that this goes for anybody who doesn't even suffer with addiction. I mean, your book talks about that all the time. Like the, the mind is the most powerful thing. And this is why I am constantly working and helping other people to overcome the mindset and starting the day in positivity, because those are the things that you have to do in order to be mentally and emotionally, spiritually fit. So the, those are the things that I've done and continue to do to this day. Because remember, uh, addiction or not, if you want to feel good, I, I really believe if you want to live a happy healthy life. You have to put in the work. It's not just, I'm going to wake up every day and it's going to be rainbows and butterflies and I'm okay. I believe that work has to be done whether you're an addiction or not, you know? I'm, I'm sitting here smiling and I have such a feeling of pride for you about what you've accomplished and how you've turned your life around. It's just, I'm amazed at what a great job you've done. So what what you said is, and this, by the way, the little bit you just told us now matches with the hundreds of people I've studied and the organizations I've studied, where they said, we never do it by ourselves. You need help. You had your guide. Until you said, I want a guide, nothing really was happening. You were, you were stalemated. I yes. want a guide. That guide helped you create a goal and had you gave you a process to follow an incremental step-by-step -step process so that you could accomplish a goal that at the time yes. seemed totally impossible. Absolutely. So it, it's that, that focusing on the positive goal, the help, somebody to help with emotions, somebody to help with the, the technical aspects of it, the strategies, uh, the knowledge Everything. and skill. You gained a whole bunch of knowledge and skill you became consciously competent about how to stay sober and to train your brain. Yes, train your brain. That's the best way to put it. I had to have my hand held. And I can say that today and I'm okay with that. But there was a time for me to ask for help was out of the question. Asking for help meant that I was weak. No, I can do this. I got this. That's why I sat in those chairs for 10 months and didn't get a sponsor because I thought still somehow, some way, I'm gonna figure this out on my own because I don't need help from anybody. And then as I told you, I'm sitting in there the chairs and I'm still, I'm still depressed, I'm still unhappy. And I knew that I had to, I had to take somebody's hand and I had to have them hold my hand and show me the freaking way. And I'm proud to say that I had somebody hold my hand and show me the way because now I get to hold somebody else's hand and I get to show them the way and that is the most that, that's the greatest feeling on earth right there so in this process that you are following with your guide one of the things you had to do was make some significant changes in habit patterns who you associated with how you associated the kinds of foods you consumed where you went what you did your thinking you had to change all kinds of habit patterns. What was that like? 
oh God, miserable at first, you know? Uh, you have to change people, places, and things. I had to change everything. There wasn't just, I mean, I was living in absolute darkness. So there wasn't even any part of my life that I would have wanted to hold on to, which is really funny because once I started receiving the help, right? You have to change people, places, and things. My mind is so resistive. Like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do this. But why? What's the alternative? Going back to the way that I was living. So I had to just make those changes. And first of all, I lost all my friends anyway. So that was okay because now I just get to make new friends. I didn't have anybody in my life that even wanted to be around. Not even the bad drugs wanted to be around me. You know, the birds of a feather flock together. Well, the alcoholics didn't even want to be around me. So I didn't have any friends. So that one was a good thing. Not going to bars. Like that was a big one, right? You can't go to bars no more. And for me, I was like, man, I don't ever want to not go to a bar. Bars are fun, but bars weren't fun anymore. Those weren't fun for me anymore. And I had to like remind myself, you had a horrible time. Every, every time you went to a bar, something bad happened. So why would you miss that? But, and then to think I can never take a drink again. That was the, that was the scariest part. So there's a part in the book and it's called the jumping off place. The book of Alcoholics Anonymous, right? It says, um, oh my gosh, why am I forgetting it? Oh, to picture my life uh, with alcohol or without alcohol. That's the jumping off place. I can no longer picture my life with alcohol because I don't want it. But to picture my life without alcohol, that was scary because that was my comfort. That was my solution. That's how I coped. That's how I shoved all the pain and the emotions down. So to take that away, oh my God, it's like, oh, you just want to hold on to it. You want to hold on to it, but you know, it doesn't do nothing for you. So that battle of wanting it and not wanting it, that is just a very miserable place to be, but it's a place that every person has to come to in their mind, whatever changes they're trying to make, how, however big or small the change is, you have to realize that you're going to come to that place. You either want it or you don't. What is it doing for you? Is it serving you? Is it not? And then you have to, you have to fight. That's just the only word. You have to fight. You got to fight for the change. So when you, when you were going about stopping the habit of going to bars or when you were uh, trying to stop any other habit that was going to be harmful to you what did your guide help you with or what did you figure out you had to do to not let that habit control you because habits control up to 75 percent of everything we do every single day in a very they're intangible so you don't even know they're controlling you so how did you become aware of that habit and not allow it to to take you in a direction that you didn't want to go I stayed away from them. I steered clear. And again, I just kept taking that guidance. When I say it was like, when I say taking that from my sponsor, you know, that guide, um, I just stayed in the middle of the habits that I needed to for my sobriety, showing up to meetings, being of service, working the steps and just staying surrounded by the people that were going to carry me through all of that and just staying away. I didn't go to bars. Um, and when I got sober, do you remember how alcohol did it used to be in grocery stores? Right. But, uh, now it is, well, that happened right after I literally got sober. So I complete treatment and now alcohol is in freaking grocery stores. And I'm like, great. So now I got to walk in the store and just be tormented by all these bottles of liquor, just like calling my name. It's, it was so just traumatizing is the word, man. And, but you just have to, you have to stay close to the people that are going to help you through it again not doing it alone. You have to have that support. You have to have that help. So was your guide part of your accountability process holding you accountable? Oh, absolutely. Anybody absolutely. else holding you accountable? Yeah, everybody. I mean, when you go to Alcoholics Anonymous, you have your sponsor and then you have everybody there in the rooms as well. So one of the first things that they have you do is to get a phone list of people. So when you're struggling and you're going through it, you got to pick up that phone and you got to make a phone call to somebody to help you through that moment that you want to go and drink, you want to go to that bar, you want to do those things. You got to stay here. You got to stay here. You got to stay focused. That's why anybody that gets sober, it's, it's, it's really, 
it is a miracle. It's fascinating because to go from such an extreme to be here and to be focused and to stay in the middle, it takes, I mean, I, I just can't really describe it. It's just, it's amazing. It really is. The power of what happens in AA and the, the people that help you all, they're not helping you. They're not getting paid to help you. You know, we're there one alcoholic helping another alcoholic. So even today when I help people, I don't care if the person has 24 hours and I've got, I'll have nine years next month. It's not about the time that I have. I'm an alcoholic. You're an alcoholic. Let's work this. Okay. Let's, let's stay here. This is what we got to do. And this is how we're going to stay sober. So as you're talking, there are a bunch of people that are not only holding you accountable, but have very high expectations of you. And they're expecting you to follow the steps. They're expecting you when you're feeling insecure, like you want to go back to, to dial a number and call you. They expect that you're going to succeed. How is that different than what you experienced when you were involved in it? What were the expectations of other people that you were with when you were involved with all that crap? Expectations of how they treated me or? The, no, the, the people, the, when, you, when you were not sober, when you were drinking all the time and you tried to break out, did you have any of the people that you were associating with at the time give you a hard time because they, they said, no, we no. want you here, we want you? No? I actually didn't. So. I mean, a lot of people go to Alcoholics Anonymous and they have relapses, you know, like Evan, my husband, you know, um, but thankfully I've never had that experience. So, and I don't ever want to have that experience, but I, when I went to AA, I stayed and I planned to stay. Okay. I didn't, I didn't state my question effectively. Before you started AA, when you were in the, in the dregs of all the crap you were involved with there was there was nobody there saying you don't have to do this right there everybody was saying come on get another drink have another drink have another drink that was the expectation for you then right right and now you've got this different expectation for yourself and their reinforcement and even back in the old days if you had the expectation that you you didn't want you wanted to stop drinking you were going to stop drinking you still went back to it because part of it was they, they were pulling you back, these other people with low expectations of you. Right. Yeah. So the people that I surrounded myself with, and not to talk bad about those people, but they're people that have low expectations of themselves also. That's why I hung out with people like that. I wasn't going to be hanging out with people that were doing good in their life. Why? Because that would just make me feel terrible about myself. So the expectations I even had of them were, yeah, we're low, we're low level loser, loser drunks. Really, that's that's how it was. Now, shortly after I met you, I was impressed with your self confidence, your belief in yourself, uh, your willingness to do whatever it took to get the job done. You could tell by your conversations and things that you uh, shared. And self-efficacy is one of the five intangibles and it's, it's the belief you develop in yourself that whatever problem you face, you can handle it. And over these nine years, I'm sure that that self-efficacy, that belief in yourself has grown immensely because you're not the same woman now that you were nine years ago. Absolutely. How has that changed? How has that developed? Gosh, I could just talk about this forever. It'd be really cool if we had like a video of us like nine years ago when I got sober and then doing one now. But what has changed obviously is the work that I have put in, right? And I just don't see obstacles today. My mind just doesn't operate that way. Like, if there, we all are going to have obstacles, right? We're going to face things, but I just believe there's always a way around it. There's always a solution. There's always a way to plow right through the problem. So whatever it is that I am faced with, I just face it. I face it knowing that I have the tools and the knowledge and the support to get through whatever it is that I need 
to get through. And my belief in myself today, I'm proud of the belief that I have in myself today because I really do believe that I'm meant to be here on this earth for a reason. I have a purpose and there's a reason why I, I made it and I'm alive. I drank hoping that I didn't wake up and I always freaking woke up and I drank a lot. I mean, there were one of the DUIs that I had, uh, I wasn't even coherent to do a, um, a breathalyzer test. So they had to draw my blood and it was a 0.419, 0.419. And the doctor, when I woke up, they said, I don't even know how you're alive. And that wasn't the first time that I heard that from a doctor. And the reason that I share that is because to go from that to this, um, it's, it's such a proud feeling and the belief, if I can freaking get through that, this is why I don't see obstacles. This is why I don't approach problems. I, I approach it with, yeah, it might be a struggle. It might be scary to face this problem, but if I can get through what I went through, I can freaking conquer anything that comes my way. So that belief comes from that. Okay. Let's get very practical. You've got little ones. You've got a husband. You've got a business. There are a many people out there that are in a very similar situation to yours. How do you, given this self-efficacy, when there's a problem with the kids, I've seen you posted one or both of them were sick or a uh, problem with your husband. How did you approach that? What was your self-talk? What were you saying to yourself when these obstacles arose? Because your self-talk drives your behavior. Yeah, absolutely. So specifically, my first thought was Evan when you just brought that up. So the moment that he told me that he relapsed, we were sitting at the kitchen table and the flood of emotions come through, right? Like all of these feelings and the resentment, but the also the emotion of also going through this before and knowing what it's like to be on the other end. I just knew that I had to, to be there because ripping him up and drilling him is not going to do any good. So the only thing, and I know in my own personal experience through addiction, that the only person that can help me is me. So I can say and do everything uh, to Evan, but ultimately it has to come down to him. And I had to just basically walk in faith and believe and know that everything is going to be okay. Not knowing that the outcome is going to be okay, but in that moment, knowing that I had to, and I think, I mean, I don't know if I would have reacted differently if we didn't have kids yet. Well, he did relapse before we had kids also, but in that moment, I knew as a mother, like, again, it goes into kind of fight mode, like, okay, this is it. This is what we're faced with but we have two little kids. I know for me, even if you don't stay sober, I know that I'm going to stay sober for myself and for little Raven and McKenna. So I'm going to be a strong mom for them. So you, you literally had conversations with yourself. You had yeah. to deal with the, the negative, the initial negative reactions that you had. And then you had to, you had to deal with that. And then you had to get rid of those and yeah, get your frontal lobe working to say, I've got to do this. I can't respond to these negative thoughts yes. because those negative thoughts aren't going to help the situation whatsoever. Yeah, it's that emotion commotion that you're talking about. It's like, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm good in my life, right? But something like that happens, it's going to put you into a spin. So my head was going all sorts of ways and I had to like slow down, process, take a step back. Okay, what do I need to do? And again, eliminating what's not going to serve me, what's not going to serve Evan, what's not going to serve our family, and then just walking through that process of it. So yes, it is a process that you have to break down in your mind and you have to, you got to like focus, right? You have to focus on the bad and the good. And then you have to figure out what you're going to do from that point. So I get the impression that you feel like you can control most situations, but if you can't control the situation, you can definitely control your reaction to the situation. Yeah. So I know that I've shared that with you. Um, and that's a, something that we that I've heard that I was taught in AA was that the only thing that I'm in control of is my action 
my attitude and my reaction. So I have to remind myself of that, that I am only in control of my attitude, my attitude on a daily basis, my actions on a daily basis. What am I going to do to keep my feet moving forward? And my reaction, how am I going to react to the situation? And this is not me saying like, I say that bill, but there's many times that I've reacted poorly. Okay. So this is not me putting myself on a pedestal. Like I got this and I always react in a positive way because that's not true. And that's not reality because I absolutely have reacted in bad ways, but it's those bad reactions that help me in the next situation where I'm like, okay, what do I need to do differently this time? So I always believe everything we go through good or bad is an experience, right? And we get to learn from those experiences. If you are solid in your mind, right? Like I feel like if you're focusing on those things, that's how you're able to work through those things. All right. I'm going to throw you kind of a curveball now. But okay. I'm only doing it because I know you're going to hit it out of the park. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully. <laughs> so there's going to be young mothers, maybe young single mothers watching this. I want to know whether, whether they have a substance abuse problem, an alcohol problem, whether they just have the everyday problems of being a young family, trying to make ends meet, dealing with the COVID crap, dealing with, uh, do we have enough money? We always run out of money before the end of the month kind of thing. What advice, what is one or two pieces of advice you would give to young to families with young children in today's society? Oh God, the first one I would say is don't be afraid to ask for help. That was one of the first things that just came to my mind when you said that, because we always feel, and especially as mothers, right? Especially we feel like we have to hold down the fort. We can't ask for help. We got to figure things out. Um, but whether it's financially, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, it's okay to ask for help. And then you have to have the courage to ask for help. So you have to be courageous enough to ask for help. The help is there. Help is all around us. We just have to be willing to ask for help. And then I would say the second thing is you got to get into action. You have to change. You have to change your ways because in those, like you said, living the month to month and just struggling, those struggles come from not taking positive actions. So you have to be willing to do things that you're not necessarily gonna wanna do. Do you think I wanted to get a sponsor? Do you think I wanted to work the steps? Do I wanna commit and go to these meetings for the rest of my life? And do I wanna do those things? No, but it's positive actions that I take every single day that allow me to walk through life with my head held high and to know that I can be anything that I wanna be. Life is not meant to be a struggle. So you have to take positive action. You have to work on yourself. You have to train your brain to be different, to want more and to go for more. Because if you continue to do what you've done, you're going to get what you always got. What you've got, <laughs> what you want. That's right. If you continue to do what you do, or my dad always says, if you always do what you always did, you're going to get what you always got. And I always hated hearing it, but it's true. If your life sucks, you have to change. Nobody else can change for you. And well, that's a hard place to be in, knowing that, okay, I feel this way. My life sucks. Every day I wake up is a depression. But knowing that I, I can change it, that's a hard place to be, right? But you have to ask yourself, what kind of life do you want to have? And I know for me, I don't ever want to go back to that freaking life. I refuse to go back to that life. So I work on myself every single day. I keep my feet moving. I take positive actions. I fill my brain. I learn. I have mentors. I read books. Every author of a book is a mentor. That's how I view it. I view you as a mentor because I'm reading the book and I'm learning. I'm learning knowledge. But then just like you talk about in the book, it, it's only going to help you if you take action. Knowledge is potential power. Potential power because it's 
You can read all the books that you want. So people think, oh, I'm doing good. I'm reading all these books, but nothing is happening. Well, what action are you taking? What actions are you taking? Are you applying what you are learning from the books that you are reading, from the podcasts that you are listening to? You have to apply action. So ask for help and take action. I think those are two really good pieces because both of them are... Uh, both of them are what I have learned in studying lots of people that they, they, they would say very similar things. You've got to do those to get yourself going. You can't be always in this analysis paralysis kind of thing. So yeah. uh, one, other, one other thing. From birth to death, life is a series of challenges. And I think how you respond to those challenges determines your quality of life. The problem is, and I want your reaction to this, I think there's a lot of people out there that think that they're supposed to have this glorious life and every time a roadblock or an obstacle or a barrier or a problem comes up, they get all pissed off and hissy fitting uh, because, whoa, wh wh why are they doing this to me? Why am I the victim, blah, 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 blah. When if they had the realistic expectation that you're going to experience one challenge after another. That's the way life is. Then I think they would be better prepared to deal with it. Yeah, not only that, but I feel like people view challenges as a bad thing. But if you turn that around and you view your challenge as a good thing, maybe that challenge is there for a reason, to teach you a lesson, to help you in an area that you didn't realize. Every challenge that we face is an experience that we get, no matter how big or how small, that we, it's an experience that we can either learn from and grow from, or we can just stop and stop taking action because it frustrates us that bad that we just don't even want to move forward. And unfortunately that happens to so many people. They deal with one tiny roadblock and they think, well, this wasn't meant for me. Can't do it. Let me just sit back down and not, not take a chance. It's like, no, rise up in the challenge, learn from it. What can you do? How can you face it? And then the beautiful thing about going through a challenge is that somebody else along the way is going to have that very same challenge. And then you get to help somebody through that challenge. And people just don't view challenges that way. So I think challenges are a good thing. Do they suck going through? Yeah, but they're good for us. They make us stronger. They give us experience in life. That's how I view a challenge. I don't view challenges as a bad thing. You just said it. Challenges are the source of our strengths. Yes. They cause us to be stronger every time we have to overcome a challenge. Well, think about it. Think about people that love to work out, people, fitness people, okay? What are you doing? You are challenging your body every single day you work out in one way or another, whether it's using your own body weight or using other weights, whether it's using bands, whatever, using a step, you're challenging your body and they know that when you, when you experience a challenge, you get stronger, okay? It's amazing to me they can't translate that to the other aspects of their life where they experience challenges, they get stronger. Yeah, I agree. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> because, I mean, the fight that you bring into a workout is the same fight that you gotta bring in your life, that moment that you wanna give up. The moment that you want to give up, what are you going to do? Are you going to give up or are you going to fight through it? And what happens when you fight through it? It's empowering. You feel good. Man, I did that. So people don't realize on the other side of that challenge is that accomplishment, that feeling. And it's those feelings that you gain that in the next challenge, you know, okay, I know it sucks right here, but if I can just get to the other side, I know that I'm going to feel accomplished. And I love that feeling. But see, Here's the thing. I don't know that the majority of people give themselves that intrinsic reward. I don't know that the majority of people say, holy crap, look at what I've done. I've worked through this. I wanted to quit three times, but I kept going. I did it. I yeah. don't think they say that to themselves. And I think that's a big mistake because that's part of what keeps them going. Absolutely. We have to learn to celebrate our wins. I mean, Shanti talks about that all the time. We have to learn to celebrate no matter how big or how small you have to celebrate your wins. And that's something I even have to say to myself because there's times 
in sobriety where I feel down and I'm like, man, look how far you've come, man. Like you got this. I have to like pep talk myself. It's all about that self-talk, right? Other people can say stuff to me, but if I don't have that good self-talk, other people can try all day long to pep talk me, to motivate me. But ultimately it comes down to your own mind. It comes down to you. And I think for a long time too, I relied on those outside people to help me feel better. Um, and that's okay, you know, because it's a journey. It's a learning process, right? But I do know now today that ultimately I'm the one that creates the, the life that I have. Well, and, and you, you, you used the word self-talk and mind. Self-talk is a form of mind control. Yeah. When, when you're saying positive or where you're saying negative things to yourself, it's a form of controlling your mind and that makes you focus on either the positive or the negative. Yeah, I'm a self-talker all the way and I'm, and I'm proud to be a self-talker because you really have to pep talk yourself. From the minute you wake up, I, I listened to this awesome YouTube motivational video by Steve Harvey one time. Um, and he says, when you wake up, you have factory workers, you have your negative side and you have your positive side and you're the boss of all those factory workers, right? And when you wake up, the first thought that you have, um, uh, this is gonna be, this, this day's gonna suck. Well, one of those negative factory workers hears the boss say that and he goes back and tells all the other negative factory workers, hey, the boss says he's gonna have a negative day. So let's get to work and they all go to work. But if you rise up and you're like, today's gonna be a great day and I expect miracles to happen today is going to be an awesome day full of love and inspiration the positive side comes up and said hey the boss said today is going to be an amazing day he expects miracles to happen so we got to get to work so it's a driving force the mind is so powerful so you have from the first thoughts that you think when you wake up you have they have to be positive they do and they're not going to be positive every day i'm saying this but i don't wake up every day rainbows and butterflies it's not how it is but I've learned to train it to where if I am negative, I got to switch it around. I got to change it. And the important thing you said was, I love the analogy with the workers because you say it's going to be a good day, but you still have to put in the work to make it a good day. It yes. doesn't happen just by hope. Hope is not a strategy. Yes. It is the positive it's going to be good, but I've got to do things to make it good. It doesn't just get laid on me. And that again, that's an expectation some people have. If I think about it enough, or if I hope for it, it's going to happen. No, you got to work at it. Yeah. You just can't. There's no other. And it also <laughs> yeah, there just isn't. Long, <laughs> yeah. And it also <laughs> takes a long time. I mean, it might take you months. It might take you years. Some of the people I studied took three, five, seven, nine years, 11 years. So, yeah. Okay, just, just to close, any, any final thoughts or words of advice or suggestions you have for people that are experiencing trauma or have a huge goal that they're trying to work to accomplish and they're not being as, as successful as they would like? I know this is going to seem like just a very simple answer, but it's words that I just live by. It's words that I live by. Keep your feet moving forward and always look for the good. Always look for the good. And the reason why that is so important and why I live by that, because it's so easy to focus on the negative. But as long as you keep your feet moving forward and you take action and you look for the good, because the good is all around. I don't care how bad somebody has it. Any day that you wake up and you have a freaking heartbeat is a good day. There's always something to be grateful for. You have to get in action. You have to apply habits to your life in order for your life to get better. And I know, I know when I got sober and just started my journey, like it sucked hearing that you have to take action. But then, like we just said, Bill, there's no other way. I'm sorry to tell that to you, but there's no other way. But keep your feet moving forward. Always look for the good. And the last one is the most important is to never give up. Keep your feet moving forward, even when it feels like you're crawling through mud. I teach this to my boot camp. There's going to be days you wake up and it feels like you're crawling through mud. Well, I need you to freaking crawl through that mud. I need you to climb that mountain and I need you to keep going. Because when you keep going, that's when you get stronger. You cannot get stronger if you give up. 
a lot of people on their journey, they stop and they pause because they're facing those challenges and they think that it's over without realizing if they just keep going, no matter how slow they're going, if you're going and you're moving your feet, you're making progress. You're making progress. And that is what we should all strive for every day is to make progress, to be the best that we can be having those struggle days, but walking through those struggle days because struggles are a part of life and struggles make us stronger. They really do. Wow. You got it together, girl. That's a great way to end this. Powerful. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no, thank you, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, by tomorrow, I would think you're going to get uh, the link to for the Dropbox for this okay. and uh, take a look at it. And if there's nothing that you're concerned about, great. And if there is, let me know and we'll delete it. And then I'll use bits and pieces as, but as we go along. So, uh, and just to restate, you are one awesome lady. I am so impressed. I'm more impressed than I've ever been right now. So thank you, Bill. And just thank you again. I'm honestly just deeply honored to even be sitting here talking to you right now. So this has been great. And just thank you for doing this with me. It's been wonderful. And there's tons of stuff in here that we're going to be able to use in one way, shape or fashion, because you say things with such conviction and such, uh, uh, yeah, conviction is the right word. So that's awesome. <laughs> Okay. All okay. right, Bill. You have Thank an you. awesome, awesome Big day. Big hugs. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.